Get the intel, the podcast meant for those of us trying to find out what the hell is going on in the field. Here, we discuss tools, techniques, and approaches that you can implement to streamline operations and let you focus on your craft. Hello, Chad Gill here. I'm the host of the Get the Intel podcast, where I talk with leaders in contracting, management, and anyone helping us do business better. This episode is brought to you by Workforce Recon. Recon is a project tracking software that connects the office to field crews. Their app, Field Recon, is built with a field-first mentality, developed by contractors for contractors. It includes time and asset tracking, messaging, job documentation, and scheduling all in one place so you can see what's going on in the field. Tired of finding out what happened days later? Check us out at WorkforceRecon.com and see your operation in real time. So joining me today is David Bailey. Uh, he is the president of Daily ba David Bailey Associates, a firm which handles public relations, government affairs, and lobbying services, and has been in operation for almost 40 years. He's also the host of the This Week in Virginia weekly live streaming series, which gives Virginians an in-depth look at the important developments and decisions coming out of the Capitol. And today we're going to be talking about uh, how you and should you be active in politics. You know, so thank you, Dave, for coming on. I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate you helping us out with, uh, you know, leading the charge on uh, trying to deal with some pay when pay college check stuff we did. Well, it's, it's good to be on with you and, and, and to start in on that why. Well, it's only if you want something positive to happen and, and something negative not to happen. That, those would be the only reasons to be involved, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Well, they say keep politics out of work, you know, but. Um, but, you know, politics affects your work and, uh, you know, trying to trying to be around it. You kind of have to. Yeah. And, and the way I interpret that is keep partisan politics out, out of, out of work. And, and I work to do that at the Capitol, keep partisan works out, because uh, when bills are, are voted on or voted down, it's it really is rarely strictly a party line vote. I mean, it's their individual legislators and. The, the uh, public media so often likes to highlight the food fights where there's the Democrats kill the Republican bill, Republicans kill the, the Democrats bill. They don't talk about the vast majority of the bills where the votes are mixed. And so uh, keep partisan politics out, but just work to kind of accomplish whatever the goal is. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I know when we were working together at the Virginia Capitol, I mean, our show is about Virginia or is based in Virginia. I was really surprised that you really couldn't tell who was who in the questions and the approach and stuff like that. I mean, there were people you didn't necessarily agree with and that kind of thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't like you, it was not a shockingly real life was not quite like TV. <laughs> and that's why Chad, it was great that you could be there and some of your colleagues because un until you see it, uh, if you're just depending on what, uh, what you read, what you happen to see that makes the uh, 30 seconds or even 60 seconds on the news, you would think it was something else. Yeah. And, and, and probably a lot of the, the, the main work that's done is not in the highlights. Um, so how does it start? And I guess, I guess, well, how did you get into being, you know, a lobbyist uh, and, 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 you know, what, what drew you into this? I was always interested in politics from youth and from uh, college and what really kicked it off was my older daughter wanted to be a page in the House of Delegates. And I said, how do you become a page in the House of Delegates? Well, that becomes political, not necessarily partisan, but it comes political. And after the success of getting her uh, chosen as a page in the House, uh, it, it whetted my appetite to, to work at the Capitol. And I got an opportunity later that year and really haven't looked back. It's it's. It's, it's great to, uh, to, to work with people who, who want to transform and change state government. And practically all of the clients that I've worked with, and you notice I use the word with, not for, but most of the ones I've worked with have been ones who are willing to roll up their sleeves and make some contacts. I mean, there, there are large corporations that have uh, lobbyists working for them, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I like to be with the folks who, who said, okay, we have some vested interest in this. We're only going to pay you for what you're doing, but we're going to do our part as well. 
And I think that may, I mean, it's easier to make a case when you hear from the person who's really experiencing, you know, either side of it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a much more honest view of it. How does it, how does it start? You know, so let's say that you have something and you're just, you find it egregious or you think, Hey, you know, is it, and some things really, you can only address at the government level. Um, and I hate to admit it, but that's the way it is. But how do you, how do you get started? What does it even look like? You know, I, I remember years ago talking with Sumter Pretty, he headed up the retail merchant. Sumter died recently, a great lobbyist figure around the Capitol. And it was somewhere along in April around the reconvene day. And I was looking at my calendar. I said, so Sumter, when does the next session start? He said, Bailey, it has started. <laughs> that has stuck with me because with part-time, particularly with part-time legislators, we as advocates or lobbyists or just individual citizens have to be working pretty much year round. The, the legislators, you know, reconvene day this year is April 27th. The next session starts April 28th. Oh my really, God. And it's time to start talking to legislators. Say, you know, you fixed part of that issue, but there's still more that needs to be done. Or here's another issue. And so they start looking into it and, and then it works its way up to, the fall and, and November to getting a bill actually introduced. With the part-time citizen legislature, the, the, the biggest mistake that I see some organizations make is they come up with a great idea in December, they approach a legislator and they say, you know, I've got my limit or there's no time to deal with that. Why don't you, you know, talk to me after the session for the next year? So, uh, uh, Chad, we need to be thinking and, and contractors and others need to be thinking and talking about what needs to be fixed in 23 and start actually in May. What is starting to look like? Does it that you you take your idea and you do you choose your local legislator? Do you find the one in your district? Do you start with a senator or a delegate or just somebody you know? You know, uh, excellent question. And any of those would work. Uh, when I have a group ask ask me and work with me i'd say let me work with you in picking the legislator uh they are all they all have one vote but sometimes it depends on which committees they they sit on or is that person a chair of the committee and and so sometimes it's it's good to be strategic in picking the chief patron don't have to but it really it really helps so if you're working with a lobbyist then work with the lobbyist and picking the picking the patron. If you're not, just take it to your own delegate, your own senator. So working, I mean, do you work with lobbyists? I mean, obviously you and I work together and I wasn't paying you, which was, which is good for me, but how, but so, but you were being compensated. So you're, is it, is it, is it, if you want to work with a lobbyist, do you typically do that through associations or, I mean, I guess, you know, you could hire a lobbyist directly. Uh, I have over the years, I've been retained uh, by an individual for one session on one, one issue, but usually it is an association. Uh, the way we interact and got connected, I represent the Alliance for Construction Excellence. Uh, you can look them up under ACE. They're in North Virginia. They're an association of subcontractors, and, and they, they do work in Maryland, D.C., and in Virginia. I'm their Virginia lobbyist. So they were very interested in that Senate Bill 550 and interested, but really it was a Richmond contractors group that got the ball started. I, don't, I haven't asked uh, Rob, the lobbyist and others, what, what month did you all start? But I can tell you, they did not start in December. They had been working earlier than that to uh, find their patrons, to start making their case, figure out what the opposition is going to say. That's the other interesting thing. If you, Chad, come in and talk with a legislator, if I go as a lobbyist, most of the legislators would say, after we hear our, they hear our pitch, okay, what's the other side going to tell me? Yeah. And, and to be really, and to tell them and say, and to point out the weaknesses in the other side's argument, of course, but that's the other side will say, don't do it for these three reasons or whatever. So it, it uh, uh, most of the work is done through, associations uh, or companies, uh, corporations can, can retain someone. And, but I think the main thing, however it's done is to get started in late spring or early summer. Don't wait to fall or don't wait to uh, session time. And so 
if you don't have a lobbyist or don't know a lobbyist, simply try to reach out to your your representative, either a senator or a delegate, and say, try to schedule them. I mean, do you just kind of roll by their office and say, hey, I have this thing I'd like to talk to you about? I mean, they are your representative. Right, right. And and find out if it's something that interests them. And they may say, you know, uh, you got an interesting point, but I serve on the Agriculture Committee. I don't serve on general laws or I don't serve on a committee dealing with construction. Um what if I got you in touch with one of my colleagues? They will say that at times, and and that's a that's a helpful thing. Or they might say, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. Let me look into that. The legislators have access to legislative services, uh, an entity that the state the General Assembly has of, of highly qualified, competent lawyers who would do the research for them on an issue. So hmm. if the delegate or you were the senator and I approached you and you might be saying, I don't know what David's talking about, but let me look into this. Probably your next call or your next email would be to someone in legislative services and saying, I had a constituent bring this issue to me. Can you tell me what's in the code already? And they're part time. And so they must have that kind of legal backup, even even if they're lawyers, as some of them are, but they need that back backup. So uh because most of them are, are working a day job as well. Some of them are retired. Most of them are working a day job or a day job that pays roughly $20,000 a year. Which was easy to forget. You know, when you're sitting there and you get upset, I know we were there until, I don't know, eight thirty nine 9 o'clock at night. And they had started, you know, fairly early. And one of the guys is an HVAC contractor. And, you know, he was talking about his tool bag and his tools and the jobs that he did. And he totally understood what we were talking about. It's easy to forget that they, these are not, I mean, they're professional legislators, but like you said, part time. Is that, is that common in most state legislatures? It, it's more common than you would think. There are very few that are really are full time. Uh, I think Nevada may be the one that has a session every other year, but <laughs> part time. But most of them, I mean, in our neighboring state, of, say of Maryland, their sessions are, are a little bit longer at times. But again, they're they're not year round employed to be year round, and that's true in most most states. Even though the workload has increased, even though they they dealt this year with about twenty one hundred bills, right. and passed uh, about I looked up at the numbers, they passed only about eight hundred and fifty of those 2100 bills but but someone in some committee had to take some time to look at those bills and then to get a motion to send it on out of the committee or to most of the bills that were killed were killed in committees not on the floor of the house or the senate right and then that's so the process of a bill, I mean, I feel like I should be singing that song. I'm a bill, I'm a bill, but you know, it's like, I'm just a bill, but it, so it starts. Um, so you take it to a legislator and say, Hey, this is what I want to do. You convince them or they point you to the person that you can convince to, to bring it up. Now it goes into committee on both sides. Correct. Yeah. It, uh, unless there are two bills as they're sometimes called companion bills, they say there's just a single bill. It goes into the committee on the Senate or on the house. Uh, and then it works its way through, hopefully, if it's a good bill, then it gets to the other chamber. And even if you have, say, two bills, a House and a Senate bill, and they both pass, they still have to cross over to the other, other chamber and it'll be approved in the other chamber. So there, there's, there's value in having companion bills at times, and there's value in just focusing on one chamber and getting the bill through the one chamber initially. So it it's it's worked different ways by different organizations, different lobbyists, different different subjects. That uh, and, and as you know, on the bill that we worked with, there were companion bills, but the House patron decided he wanted to wait and see what happened in the Senate. So he yep. let his bill just stay there and and uh, have a, a gentle take it off of life support. But then when the, the bill would come over from the Senate, then he supported the Senate bill, but. Um, but he decided it'd be better to see because if the Senate won't pass it, I don't think the House will with some of his reasoning. And it was very good reasoning. Right. He chose to do that. Yeah, I guess I guess everybody wants to have a good closing rate. You know, they want to make sure that the bills they propose go through. Uh, I guess that points to what you do. 
Yeah, I'm sure that that's that's what it between campaigning and then doing this stuff during the year and then trying to hold a regular job. It, it looks like it would be a bit of a struggle. Plus, I'm sure you get tired of being the ear to everybody's complaints as a as a legislator as well. Oh, I am sure they do. And one of the biggest complaints that they have that I fully understand is if I or citizen Jane or John would come and talk to them about a bill that's in the other chamber and they're focused, they got to focus on the bills that they have. And they say, well, they would say to me, David, you know, don't talk to me now. Wait and see if the bill gets out of the other chamber. Yeah. And, and the other complaint that they have at times, Chad, is I'm hearing from people from all over the state and that's fine, but really I want to hear from my constituents. The, the yeah. worst thing, First thing that I can hear in a committee, if I were representing you or your organization, would be for a delegate or a senator to say, David, I, ha I haven't heard from anybody back home. Uh, I have heard that years ago, and I worked to never stand up before a committee and have anyone say, I've, I've never heard about this. Why haven't, if this is important, why haven't I heard about it? That goes right back, I think, Chad, to your opening question about being, in, being involved. Does, you could pay out a lot of money, have the, the highest priced uh, people who would represent you. But if the legislators never hear from anyone back home, the chances of passage are, are slim. And that does make sense. I mean, you're supposed to be representing your locality. And if it's not important to your locality, you should be working on something that is important to that group of people. Right. So, I mean, that's not wrong. And it doesn't mean that they don't care. It just means, like you said, you have limited time and limited resources. You deal with the people that, uh, that, that are, you are there to represent. And, and sometimes what I do during the session is remind them of the people who talked with them prior to the session, because everyone can't come to the Capitol. Uh, the pandemic opened up the use of Zoom um, and, and it still was used this session, as you know. And I understand there's no plans underway to eliminate it. It, it. So it allows people to dial in remotely and make their comments. And that's good. But yeah, I did that for one of the committee meetings. It is that really opened up government, I think, because otherwise, you know, it's between logistics of timing and parking and everything else like that. You don't know what the schedule of the committee is going to be. You know, you can, you know, that, that Zoom allows it to kind of play in the background. And then when you, the bill you're interested in, you can come up and you can speak your piece and be heard. I mean, and you would truly be heard. I mean, at least at the Virginia level where we were, I felt heard. Yes. Well, that, that enabled Ike Casey from the American Subcontractors Association, one of the ones that's part of ACE in Northern Virginia, to come on, I think, right after you, maybe and make some comment in a House, a house committee about Senate Bill 550. And uh, rather than spending the day down here, and he and others have spent the days down here in the years, and then the bill not even come up that day. Apart from being late, they say, well, okay, we're going to take the rest of these bills up at our next meeting. And, uh, yeah, that would be tough, especially when you're trying to do your job, too. Yes, yes, practic yeah. practically impossible. Practic do you get a lot of participation from constituents? Or is this something where people really need to be getting more involved? People need to be more involved because there are some constituents that are always involved, but they may not be on the same side of the issue. Yeah, they, yeah. They were, they're, they're going to be involved. I mean, I don't know that there's, whether it was an issue pertaining to uh, dogs and cats or, or pertaining to any particular issue this past session, but what there were people who were involved. And Unless, unless you have enough of your own colleagues that are involved, you say, I can sit this one out, you speak for us. But uh, uh, the mistake is made, particularly now since you can submit written testimony much easier than you could pre-pandemic. You can be in the waiting room, waiting to be called on in a, in a subcommittee or full committee meeting. Then there's, um, there's no excuse really for not having someone representing your interest in your field of work industry uh, involved. No, I think, I, I think it makes sense. And um, yeah, my dad was, when he was telling us that we should vote as kids, you know, that was one of the things he, he told us was, 
you know, if you don't vote, you can't complain about it. And you kids like to complain. <laughs> so, so you at least get, you better get out and vote. Uh, so I think that's a, a part of it too. And like you said, if you leave it to, and that's where I think a lot of the polarization comes, you know, it's like the 5% on the extremes are the one that are spending, they're the ones that are so riled up. They'll, they'll be involved like what you're saying, but you know, you're stuck with that silent majority that just thinks it's going to work out. And it doesn't always. Chat up on the wall. I have some pictures that have momentum, but besides the pictures, it's rather small, but you can maybe see a head of a donkey and the tail of the elephant. And if you're looking at it closely, there's a gap in between. My grandson is, uh, in middle school is, is an artist. Uh, in fact, now he's in first year of high school. I shouldn't say middle school, but he, he's an artist. And I, and I said to him, Matthew, you did one for me before that, uh, that, had, that had, the, had them together. And I said, that was good. You did that four years ago. I said, but Matthew, there's a gap. And you know what's in the gap? He said, what's the gap? I said, there's got to be people involved in between. Because yeah. the, two parties have, the two parties have their perspectives. They have their issues. And sometimes they work together well. Sometimes they don't. But um, uh, even if you favor one party or the other, I, I'm, I'm going to use this little drawing that, that Matthew did. And when I'm out speaking to groups and saying, look, there's space in between there's space in between the uh, donkey and the elephant symbols and it's got to be you uh, if you're going to pull them together to get a positive vote on a good bill or a down vote on a bill that's, that that really would be harmful no i think that's a good point and i think it is and, and i appreciate you taking the time with us not only today but you know, the, you know, working with us and, and stuff like that to do, to work on the Senate bill that we did. And, and, you know, more importantly, just being down and making sure that people are aware of what's going on. I, I know we talk about a lot of things on this podcast about how to invigorate, you know, employees, how to do incentive plans and how to track things in the field. But there's a lot of influences that are coming on us from the government. And that's things that you do have a say in and you do have participation in if you'll take it. And if you won't take it, then then you're just going to be affected by it. And it's a big part of what we talk about in Field Recon is, you know, hey, you can either find out later what happened or you can try to actively prevent it while it's happening. And, you know, whether it's a software solution or, a, or you know, here, a political solution, better to be in it than to be a victim of it. Right. Well, Chad, and, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. And your, your folks need to know that if they go to thisweekinvirginia.tv, they will find a podcast in which you were, I mean, a, a program in which you were the guest, did a great job of talking about the process. They'll find the most recent one of Rich Anderson, chair of the Republican Party. As I go back to the one before that, it's Susan Swecker, chair of the Democratic Party. <laughs> we work to be nonpartisan and to present people, key people, and these two party chairs are, are very important people uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, appreciate your helping explain the process to contractors you did a great job and other people that have watched it said it was well it applied obviously to more than just contractors it, it applies to being involved and in making a difference absolutely thank you david i really appreciate your time today we'll talk to you soon but i guess i would say i'll see you next session but i guess i'm going to be seeing you here in april <laughs> Thanks, thank you Thanks for listening to Get the Intel. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.